What is SOC for Cybersecurity was a live webinar that was originally produced on Thursday, March 28, 2019. For this webinar, we were joined by Mike Hoffner, Dave Hammerberg, and Josh Kowalczyk with McConley and Asbury. We hope you enjoy this recap and please visit us online at macpas.com for more information about our future webinars and other events. Thank you, Melissa. Looking forward to spending the next uh, hour with all of you talking a little bit about a service uh, that isn't widely prevalent in the marketplace yet, but we believe here at McConley and Asbury is a, an extremely valuable service that uh, we can provide to our clients as they look at one of the more significant risk areas that's facing all entities right now, which is the, the risk of cyber threats. Uh, they happen every day, uh, and many of you, I'm sure, listening have experienced uh, cybersecurity issues in your organization, and if you haven't experienced any downtime or any breaches, uh, I'm certain that you have experienced attacks uh, and things that you're concerned about. So look forward to informing a little bit on what SOC for Cybersecurity is over the next hour, uh, just by way of introduction. Um, I've been with the firm for uh, roughly 14 years. Uh, in that time, I started working with our SAS 70 practice when it was a uh, the good old days of SAS 70 and what that meant, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, I oversee our SOC 1, 2, and 3 practice at the firm. Uh, we have a, a significant amount of growth in that area over the last few years, and it's area that, an area that we continue to get phone calls on uh, as our clients and as our clients' uh, customers uh, start to have a need for their users to have some, some formal document showing their, their position on information systems controls or organizational controls. Uh, so really exciting marketplace for us to participate in. Uh, with me, I have a couple of my colleagues. We have a number of us who work in this area. So I'll ask them to introduce themselves here before we jump into the content of our presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm Josh Kowalczyk. I'm a supervisor here with McConley and Asbury. Uh, I've been here for about five years, and I mainly work in our manufacturing industry as well um, as our SOC audits. And I'm looking forward to informing you all on SOC for Cybersecurity today. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Herberg. I'm a principal here at McConley Nasbury. Been here uh, almost 19 years now, so a while. Done a lot of things for McConley Nasbury. One of those uh, areas is being a leader in the SOC 2 uh, group. Uh, my background, I'm a CPA as well as I have a pretty heavy background in security, CISSP. Um, so those two um, areas really work well for the SOC 2 program. And I'll turn it back to Mike. Thanks, Dave, and I, I do appreciate you not taking the time to go through all of the various initials and certifications you have, or we would have lost about half of the time we have allotted for this webinar. Uh, but suffice it to say, when it comes to performing SOC services for our clients, uh, I think there's a number of us in the SOC practice that are, are heavily focused on the organizational controls, the processes, uh, and what we need to do to comply with the AICPA's rules around a SOC practice uh, and a SOC engagement. Uh, Dave and a few others are those folks that really are technically deep and sound and provide a real high level of insight into our clients who are developing a, a better infrastructure and security posture as they go through the SOC process. So our agenda for our webinar uh, today is really twofold. Uh, first will be a brief review and overview of what SOC engagements are, why we do them. Uh, so there's a, a presumption when we have these conversations that when we throw out terms like SOC 1 or SOC 2 or SAS 70 that everybody knows what they are and we move on. Uh, but I do think as we get into a conversation around SOC for cybersecurity, it's helpful and healthy to have a little bit of a review of how we got here and to talk about uh, really what SOC 1, 2, and 3 are because they are uh, significantly different from SOC for cybersecurity. Uh, but then we'll spend the balance of our conversation today really having a dialogue answering questions of what is a SOC for cybersecurity. It's a fairly new service level. Uh, was released uh, not that long ago, a year or two ago. Um, and as I said earlier in our introduction, not terribly prevalent in the marketplace yet, although its acceptance is growing and I believe it will be. Uh, so we'll talk about what it is, who might benefit from it, uh, and why you may consider going through a SOC for cybersecurity examination here in the near term. So uh, we'll jump right into our background and history. 
Uh, for those of you who have been uh, working in a service organization environment for a long time, you'll remember we used to refer to SAS 70. Uh, SAS is Statement on Auditing Standards, and number 70 was called Service Organizations. And that was initially developed really as a way for a service organization to get a, a report on the effectiveness of its internal controls so that its customers, auditors, could rely on those controls that were in place. Uh, so for instance, an organization that might um, process health claims for a customer, uh, those the controls over the processing of those claims and those insurance claims is, is critical to uh, the corporation that's hiring that, that processing organization. Uh, so what they might have done before SAS 70 is actually had their audit firm go in as part of the, the user's annual audit and go into that service provider and say, I want to test your controls, um, but if I serve 50 or 100 or 200 or 400 different companies as part of what I do, uh, it became quite a time drain to have 200 different audit firms come in and test controls. So uh, SAS 70 was developed and created uh, in order for an organization, a service organization, to have just one auditor come in, test all those relevant controls, and provide a report that then could be used. Um, but the world evolved, as it always does, uh, and as the environment evolved for service organizations away from more your traditional processing and transaction processing like health claims or payroll, uh, and service organizations began to do things um, more in the line of cloud services or software as a service or, or hosting, data centers, et cetera, um, SAS 70 really didn't speak to that type of a service organization in a meaningful way. Uh, so as things grew and evolved, uh, AICPA stepped back and realized that an auditing standard really maybe wasn't the appropriate way to go, and we needed to create something a little bit new, a little bit different that would speak not only to those traditional service organizations and service providers, but also speak appropriately to those, those new generation of IT service providers, um, your data centers, your cloud services, uh, managed services, etc. Uh, so SAS 70, uh, we used for a very long time, but evolved into uh, SSA 16, and which has now been replaced uh, engagements. And SSA 18 is a, an attestation standard. So it's no longer an auditing standard. It's an attestation standard whereby a service organization can have a attestation on the effectiveness of their internal controls as those controls relate to the things that their customers and users use them for. So uh, before we move on to the, um, the little bit more background on each type of SOC services, we are going to go through a couple different polling questions today uh, to give ourselves a little bit of a understanding um, of who's on the, the audience and just to get a, a sense of what you're using and what you're seeing. So first question, as you see on the screen, is to ask what framework your organization has used for its cybersecurity risk management program. Uh, fully recognizing that the three we have listed up there are not a complete subset of frameworks that you could choose or use, uh, but just uh, in our mind represent the more uh, use, uh, the more highly used uh, framework. So uh, we also are fully understanding that many of you on the the webinar are not IT professionals or work in your IT security department and may actually have no idea what your folks have used. So that's a fair answer as well. So we'll give you another minute, a uh, couple of seconds here to give your final uh, thoughts and then we'll move on. Great. So what we're seeing is that the vast majority of the folks on our webinar have absolutely no idea what framework their organization is using. Um, and I guess that answer could mean one of two things. It could mean we know we have a cybersecurity risk management program, but we don't know what our framework is. It could also mean I have no idea what my organization is doing. Uh, if the answer is the second part of that, uh, I would consider looking back at a webinar that um, Dave and I did uh, a number of months back on a cybersecurity risk management program and how to develop and maintain one. Uh, so just something to think about. So moving on, uh, we will, well, I guess I should comment on the fact that the NIST framework was the highest uh, used of the ones we saw, which is not a surprise to us. That's the one we see most frequently as well. Uh, so moving on to uh, just a little bit more background on the current types of services available before we move into our, our new and exciting SOC for Cybersecurity world. 
Uh, first is a SOC 1. SOC 1 is, an org is a report that probably mirrors more what the traditional SAS 70 was used for. Uh, reports on the effectiveness of the internal controls at a service organization as those controls rate to relate to things the service organization does um, specific to internal control over financial reporting. So I use the example of an insurance processor. Those insurance claims are transactions that are processed on behalf of a, a customer or a user organization, uh, and the insurance expense goes straight to the user organization's financial statements, the insurance reserves go straight to the financial statements. So that insurance provider or a payroll provider uh, provides a service processing transactions on behalf of a user organization. So it really is a traditional internal controls over financial reporting that are not done at your company, but are being done by a service provider that you hire to do things. Uh, we talk a little bit about type one and type two real quickly. Type one is a is a opinion on whether those uh, those controls are in place uh, and designed properly. So the audit firm would do some walkthroughs and say, yes, we believe that you've got sound internal controls designed, but we haven't done anything to test the operating effectiveness of those. Whereas a type two actually does sampling and procedures to conclude that the controls you've defined and put in place are truly operating effectively for the purposes you've laid them out for. SOC 2, on the other hand, where SOC 1 is related to those traditional internal controls over financial reporting controls, uh, SOC 2 is that thing that was created more for the, we'll call it a, a IT services provider, whether that software is a solution or a developer, a data center, uh, but those are system-related controls that are critical to the operations of a customer or a user, but aren't directly re related to an internal control over financial reporting. Um, so again, if you have all of your data housed at a data center, well, absolutely mission critical to understand the controls over the systems that protect your data, secure your data, make sure your data is available. Uh, those are critical to a customer. Uh, they don't directly impact line items on the financial statements, and so they're more appropriately looked at. Those kinds of service providers are more appropriately looked at under a SOC 2. Um, in a SOC 1, your, your objectives that are being tested and managed are defined by the service organization to best match what their customers hire them for, where in a SOC 2, it is a consistent set of criteria that are applied based on the AICPA's trust services criteria. So you can choose security, availability, processing integrity, confidentiality, or privacy, um, or any combination thereof. Um, but won't go into any more detail on that, certainly not the purpose of what we're here for today, but if that is something that uh, you desire a little more information on, as SOC 2 is, is probably our fastest growing service uh, as an accounting firm, uh, certainly something we'd be happy to talk to you about offline after the presentation. So what's SOC 3? Um, Simply said, SOC 3 is a SOC 2, but repackaged for general distribution. So it's for the same type of organization. It's focused on the same types of criteria, but a SOC 2 is very detailed in what's included in the report. And because it's very detailed in what's included in the report, it is restricted only to the users and the auditors of the users and other folks who are impacted by that service organization. A SOC 3 is something that is very limited in the amount of information it has, but concludes on the exact same thing. We are in compliance and we have good controls in place to manage these things, um, but because it's limited description, it can be more broadly distributed, posted on websites. Uh, so a number of folks do both a SOC 2 and a SOC 3, a SOC 2 with a, the significant amount of detail to give to their customers, and a SOC 3 to post on a website or to provide to prospective users who may just want to understand that they have properly gone through that process. Uh, so that is the kind of overall uh, look at the currently existing suite of services. Uh, we're going to spend the rest of our discussion really focused on what a SOC for cybersecurity engagement is, uh, because as you'll see, it is, it is both more broadly applicable and very different uh, from the services we've traditionally offered as a profession and that many of you are probably familiar with. So before we move on to the meat of things, 
Uh, let's take a look at another polling question. This one focused on how often your organization reviews and validates the effectiveness of your cybersecurity risk management program. Um, so obviously, we would recommend that it's an ongoing evaluation. Uh, you stay fresh on things, you test things on a recurring basis, you make sure that as things change, you're updating your program, uh, but also recognize that real time may not always be the easiest thing to do. Um, and I guess if we get to the, the high volume of folks in our first polling question who have no idea, uh, I think if you're in that no idea category, maybe you go ahead and pick D as well, because if you're not sure what framework you're using, you may also not know um, exactly how often it's updated. So we'll give you another couple of seconds here to fill that in. Very good. So our results are that, uh, as we like to see, um, the largest group of our folks on the webinar have answered it's an ongoing evaluation and update. Um, Few of you are doing it quarterly. Some of you are looking at annually. Uh, I do like that. Uh, at least it's being done. Although I think annually, um, I think I would argue, we would all argue that uh, the cyber threats and the risk uh, of a cyber attack is increasing exponentially. So revisiting your program on a once a year basis, uh, I could argue might not be sufficient. Uh, but at least you're doing it. And when we manage to find the time is great if it's more than annually, but not if it means it sits on the shelf, as I think that answer often means. Uh, it means it sits on the shelf for far too long before we find time, because uh, reality is we're always, we're always chasing things that need to be done, and we never find the time to do these sorts of things. So great. So moving on, um, I think we get to what I hope that you're all dialed in to hear today, which is really to get an understanding of what this new service is that the AICPA has put forth. Um, why, why was it brought forth? What does it mean? Who is it useful for? Uh, and so we thought the best way to communicate that data is not for you all to listen to me talk anymore, but rather to hear my colleagues talk about their interpretation of some of these things. So we're just going to have a dialogue. Uh, and I'll be going through a series of questions with Dave and Josh, uh, and they are more than prepared to talk through uh, their thoughts on some of these things. And as you hear their conversations and their feedback, uh, please, as was said at the beginning of the presentation, use the interactive questioning uh, opportunity. If there's things you want clarity on, uh, pose a question. And as we have time at the end of the webinar, we'll circle back to that question and answer them for you to the best of our ability. And if we run out of time on the webinar, uh, we will answer those questions on an individual basis and we'll get back to you uh, and make sure that we, we clarify anything that may come out um, in a way that we're a little confused by. So with that, let's have a conversation. So first question is really the the big one, right? It's the, the big question of what exactly is a SOC for cybersecurity? Wh why is it different? What's different from a SOC 2? Um, and I think if we can understand a little bit of that, the rest of the questions that we're going to get into may make a little more sense. That's a great question, Mike. Uh, again, this is Dave. And you know, I guess simply put, it's a third party validation of your cybersecurity risk management program. Um, and that could be the entire program, could be a section of the program, um, and we'll get into how the SOC 2 different, uh, you know, the differences in the next question. But um, again, it's a validation. You know, is your organization continually and effectively monitoring and addressing cybersecurity risks? Um, you know, you may think you are. Uh, you might be using, you know, a lot of our clients are using this cybersecurity framework, um, but there's no third party validating if that's actually happening. Um, you know, everyone in this room doesn't, you know, um, inspect their own cars. And the reason why they don't inspect their own cars is because they don't have that expertise and they may overlook something. Um, or they do have the expertise, but, you know, it's it's their own. You need a third party to say, hey, you're good to go. Um, and it's sort of the same thing in the in the SOC for cybersecurity. Um, we're looking for that third party validation that, hey, the board, uh, you know, the, the IT security group says what's going on, the board listens to them, but, you know, just a third party saying, hey, it is actually happening. Yeah, Dave, um, this is Josh. Um, I, I agree. Um, 
I think that's definitely kind of the, the main point of SOC for cybersecurity. I think it also um, allows um, individuals to kind of receive information on, on what even is the cybersecurity risk management program um, that is um, within the organization. Um, I feel like a lot of times, um, as we saw in our polling question, um, you know, individuals within the organization believe there's a cyber security risk management program, um, but no one really knows, you know, what is necessarily involved in that, um, or if it is, you know, operating uh, to the extent that it should be. Uh, so the re so the report just kind of gives information um, to, to anyone. Um, this, this can be a report that can be to the board of directors, it can be to anyone internally, externally. Um, the report is, is pretty general and for general use, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah, I think, you know, your main point there is I think it, it can be read by a generalist. In other words, you know, a person on a board not, may not necessarily have that technical knowledge to read a SOC 2 report. Um, of course, SOC 2 is for service organizations, and, and we'll get more into what SOC for cybersecurity, what industries, et cetera, it's good for. But, um, you know, someone, anyone on the board could take a SOC for cybersecurity report and understand it. It's general. It's not getting into the details. So, you know, you brought that up, but, you know, I just want to emphasize that that is a, you know, a great thing. And, and you're not giving away the keys to the kingdom by giving this report out. You know, it's a, it's a mass report given to, um, there's no, no set amount of people you give it to, um, as opposed to some of the other um, security reports. So it's an important notation to make. So, gentlemen, the, the SOC 2 we talked about being based on the AICPA trust services criteria. And Dave, you talked a little bit about a SOC for cybersecurity really, be, really being an external validation of a risk management program. So what is a SOC for cybersecurity based on? And how, do you, how does somebody come in and measure the effectiveness of a cybersecurity risk management program? The framework you use for a SOC for cybersecurity could be really any framework. Uh, most of our clients will use NIST. Um, there's an AICPA um, framework, um, and there's a vast amount that we could, you know, it would be a whole other seminar to get into the different frameworks you could use. Um, but, you know, if you were just starting out, um, and you didn't have a framework to say, I would say probably the easiest thing would be to use the AICPA. Um, the NIST, the benefits of using the NIST cybersecurity is it's widely known um, and widely trusted, um, but it's going to take you a lot longer um, to get into that as opposed to the AICPA. So um, what was your second part of the question? Got a little nervous. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you answered it. Okay. Yeah. So, so to summarize, I think the, the SOC 2 is really related to um, – the trust services criteria and the system controls uh, as they can be measured against those where a SOC for cybersecurity is about controls and processes as they relate to the framework that you've chosen and whether they meet some of the criteria that you're expecting to meet, uh, if that's a fair way to say it. Correct. Good, good. I think um, there's a lot more to unpack about SOC for cybersecurity. <clears throat> so, Let's move forward because I think a number of these things, as you guys alluded to, we will get to in some of our later questions, um, which yeah, freely admitting um, these guys know what questions are coming at them. So I may throw a curveball or two as we go, just so you guys know. Appreciate that. Uh, we'll, Mike. we'll see. We'll see what comes <laughs> up. So let's talk about this question. If a company has a strong cybersecurity risk management program, so we saw 43% of our respondents said that they are on, have an ongoing monitoring and update of their cybersecurity risk management program. 12% uh, is quarterly, 28% look at an annual. I think all of those folks would probably sit back and say, uh, we at least have a pretty decent cybersecurity risk management program, and we're looking at it, and we're monitoring it. And I, I may not necessarily know what framework it's based on, uh, but I know we have one, and I know we're looking at it. So if I know I have a cybersecurity risk management program that's in place, why would I consider having the, the inspection done, as you said? Um, aren't my IT guys good enough? Maybe. That's that's the question. That's why you need the 
SOC for cybersecurity. If I'm sitting, you know, I sit on a couple boards. If I'm sitting on that board, um, sure, you know, the person, the security guy or the security group, I trust them. But do you really know um, that everything's getting done? Um, and I think this is, again, a third party check. And, um, you know, it, it, you don't want to use these to penalize people. You want to use them to improve your environment. So whether you're doing NIST cybersecurity framework or the AICPA, um, you want to make sure you're doing it to the fullest, right? So if you're doing this third-party verification and we go through the pre-assessment and the readiness testing, et cetera, um, there's going to be something that comes out of it that's going to make you more secure. So for one thing, it's going to improve your environment by doing this but it's also going to give you that comfort sitting on the board, sitting in management, that yes, what that person is telling me is actually what's happening. And you know, that person might not be intentionally, say lying in quotes, but maybe, you know, maybe what he thinks is happening or she thinks is happening is not necessarily happening. And that's where we're third party comes in and says, hey, you have, you know, this control is not quite working, et cetera. Um, and I think that's the benefit of SOC for cybersecurity, Mike. And I just to expand on that. Um, I'm a firm believer in uh, fresh eyes when it comes to something that I am currently working on. Um, so SOC for cybersecurity is just it gives an organization fresh eyes to come through and, and to look through the cybersecurity risk management program and maybe identify some blind spots um, that um, the organization is just missing um, or, they're, or they're not even thinking about. And it it just gives an organization a fresh perspective on um, some controls that could be put in place um, in order to prevent or uh, detect these uh, threats and security uh, threats and attacks from happening. And I, I think it also just is also, like Dave mentioned, a great way just to um, validate that the cybersecurity risk management program is working accordingly and working to its fullest. So the other thing I would add is, you know, the audience is really a whole lot larger in SOC for cybersecurity. So that's a huge benefit for SOC for cybersecurity. Um, you know, you might just give it to management and the board, but you could give it to investors. You could give it to a wide group of, you know, regulators, et cetera, um, clients, you know, a lot of people, you know, nowadays you expect a certain baseline of cybersecurity at every organization that you work with. Um, and I think probably a lot of people on this call have received spreadsheets and stuff like that that say, hey, give me your IT security policy, your vendor management policy, your all these different policies. And you're like, well, I don't want to give them away because I got technical information in there. Um, and, and plus, it takes a ton of time and it's sort of annoying a little bit. Um, this will give you a document to give to that client and to say, hey, we're up to date. We're third party verification. Um, and again, the audience is a lot more broad than a SOC 2. SOC 2 is going to go to the user entity, um, and SOC 2 is going to be a lot more drilled in on a certain scoped area. Now, not saying that we can't have SOC for cybersecurity scoped in, but most of the time it's going to be more broad. Now you can go, Mike. So, thank you. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> so we talk about having a third party look at what we're doing um, as a way to validate it. Uh, so what I'm hearing is give me an audit and tell me what I did wrong and maybe give me a document I can give to people that says I, I do an okay job. Um, that may or may not equate to value in some people's minds. So can you expand on your thoughts on how my organization can get value out of paying someone to come in and take a look at this? I mean, I think it goes back to what I just said with the baseline of cybersecurity. You know, I think organizations that don't get on the bandwagon get a framework in place, um, at least get a framework in place, if not get some kind of third-party verification validation, uh, you're going to start losing clients because they're going to see that, you know, the guy down the road is taking security uh, seriously. Um, and with every added breach, you know, users are thinking more and more. Um, so I think the value is not necessarily adding value, but you're not going to be taking value away from your company and losing clients, et cetera. Um, and again, I think it's, uh, it's just going to be normal for clients to, um, want that and accept that as normal. Yeah. And I also think it, um, 
would add value in the sense of um, if the cybersecurity risk management program is strong and is effective, it can prevent and detect these attacks before they occur. Because um, there can be a great loss of value if um, your organization is hit with a cyber attack. And then from there, you can lose um, time, you can lose data and lose customers and revenue. So the cybersecurity, SOC for Cybersecurity will give you that comfort that um, you have the proper controls and policies in place or something needs to change or you need to add additional uh, things in order to cover any attacks. Great. Well, let's keep moving. So we've already touched a little bit on this uh, in terms of I've heard both of you say uh, a SOC for cybersecurity is for anybody. Um, but let's expand on that a little more. What type of an organization makes a good candidate for a SOC for cybersecurity engagement? Uh, we talked about SOC 2 being, and SOC 1 being specifically focused on organizations that provide services to other others, whether that is a, an IT services or a transaction processing service. Um, but is, is SOC for cybersecurity better suited for any industry over another industry? Is there a particular type of candidate that really should be thinking about this? Um, and when you say it's for anybody, what do we mean by that? Who really, come on, it's not for everybody, right? Who, who really should be thinking about this? I mean, in my opinion, which I uh, pause there, in my opinion, um, I think anyone who has clients that uh, val you know, value their data that they give you um, or data that you have or data that you produce um, or product or, you know, it, 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 I don't know of an organization that won't benefit. Um, we did talk earlier. I, I'm not sure a government entity would benefit as much, um, but nonprofits, um, I can't think of a reason why you won't do it unless, you know, unless you're an organization that doesn't have clients, which I'm not sure there are many of those out there. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's really just any organization that has um, concern about cyber exposure. I mean, if you look in the news over the past few years, um, you see these pretty large companies getting uh, data breaches and losing losing data and losing customer information. Um, so it, it really is. I know, Mike, you said it's not for everyone, but it, it kind of is for, for most organizations. Um, so it's essentially kind of what your your business is, is looking for, what your organization is looking for, and if you're um, kind of worried about any cyber threats. I think, you know, it, when you're thinking about SOC for cybersecurity, um, it could be a huge deal in regards to what organization you're doing it for. So if you're an organization that really doesn't have a program in place at all right now, um, it's going to be a huge deal to get the SOC for cybersecurity because you have to put that framework in place. You're going to have to go through the readiness assessment, test all that. Um, you know, that could be a two-year process. Um, another, another organization could have the NIST framework. They think they're good to go. Um, and you go through that pre-assessment in three to six months and you get your, you know, SOC for cybersecurity and you get a uh, unqualified opinion and you're off and running. Um, but it's, uh, for every organization, it's going to be very different. So I don't have credit card data. I don't collect any personal identifiable information. I am a manufacturer who has very straightforward and simple processes. Um, and I don't have any data that any cyber criminal would want. So if I don't have anything that a cyber criminal would want, why is this relevant? I think, you know, you, you have payroll data of employees, for one thing. Um, you know, if you're making mattresses, you do it a little different than the other guy. Your competitor is going to want how you make the mattress. Um, so, you know, there's always a different way of, of thinking. Um, you wouldn't be in business if you didn't have something unique to offer. Um, and I think what people are protecting, you know, obviously when you do a risk assessment, you identify what you're protecting um, is going to be different for each individual. But I don't know of any organization out there that would say, I have nothing to protect. Um, I don't care if anyone comes in. Um, and, and on top of that, you're just not protecting data. You're preventing them from stopping you from doing business. 
right? So the hacker's coming in to do a denial of service, you know, you can't do your job, um, or they get your contact list and send out, you know, ABC mattress company down the road now has got a brand new mattress, they're sending it out, you know, email out to all of your contacts. You know, so there's different things there um, that I, th I think would validate having a framework in place even if what you say you, you don't have any credit card information, um, you don't, you know, when you said all that information, it sounded like, you know, I have nothing to sell, but you do have something of value, um, or at least most clients have something of value they're trying to protect. Excellent. Excellent. I appreciate the, um, the choice of industry you chose for your, <laughs> your case study. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about doing I'm not sure research. why mattress manufacturers is on your mind. <laughs> I understand you're tired. <laughs> um, very good. Well, let's move on to our third polling question of our presentation here. Uh, and this one's just pretty straightforward. Uh, based on what you've heard so far, and don't worry, we still have a little more to talk about. Based on what you've heard so far, do you believe that a SOC for cybersecurity engagement would be useful to the stakeholders and management of your company? Um, so we've talked about it's, it's broadly applicable. It's for everybody, um, at least according to these guys, it's for absolutely everybody, although apparently I still have my doubts. Um, but I understand the, the processes by which I manufacture my mattress are something I want to protect. I, I hear you on that. Um, so let's give everybody just another couple of seconds here. Looks like most of you have your votes in, so um, please take a few more seconds and, and log those. Um, these polling questions are the mechanism by which uh, the powers that be make sure you are present and attentive to get your CPE credit. Um, so while it is useful information to us, it's also, I think, important to those of you who are hoping for some CPE out of this. All right, let's go ahead and shut her down. Um, wonderful news, 75% uh, of you on the call think that a SOC for cybersecurity could be of use to your organization. Um, you will be getting a call from David Hammerberg sometime <laughs> in the next three to five days. And 8% of you won't be receiving CPE today. And 8% 8 of you suggest that you don't need one. Which, <laughs> Just um, joking. I, Just joking. I, that validates my <laughs> thoughts that it's maybe not for quite everybody. Um, and 17% of you are still unsure. So let's let's continue down our journey of, of conversation here and try and answer some of those questions to move the 17% of you who are unsure into a place where you would welcome that phone call from Dave Hammerberg to talk about how McConley and Asbury can assist you in preparing for and executing a SOC for cybersecurity examination. So, excellent. So this is a big question for me. So from my perspective, um, it's one thing to walk in and say, as a board member or as a executive member of management, to walk into uh, somebody in my, my IT director or somebody in my risk management department and say, get a SOC for cybersecurity. I've heard a lot from these guys. Josh sounded really intelligent on that webinar. I think we should get a SOC for cybersecurity because of that. Um, but what questions should I be asking before, before I walk into that, that office and say, I would like us to get a SOC for cybersecurity. And, and what position are you in? I'm a board asking? member. I am an outside board member who is charged with governance of an organization. Excellent. I think uh, the boards that I sit on um, don't have direct um, communication with the security group, but if I the boards I'm on, I would consider um, not asking a whole lot of questions in regards to um, to the security framework. Um, I would be asking for a software cybersecurity or a third party validation of the framework. Um, just because most board members aren't going to be that technical, um, I think I would be asking for that, and then I would get that validation, that opinion, that report, and be able to go from there. As a board member, I find it very important that my the organization that I sit on has a separate and unique security group or security person. You know, where does the buck end? All right, so um, that that would be very important to me, but even, even without that, I would, 
just want a third party validation, you know, because Mike could be the, the security guy and he tells me all is great. Frameworks great. He sends, he gives me this Excel spreadsheet that's 40 pages long of all the controls he does. Well, how do I know those controls are designed effectively, operate effectively? Mike, how do I know that? Josh did all the work. <laughs> exactly. I don't know that. So and it's perfect. <laughs> that's usually true, but in this case, uh, you know, I, I can't tell for certain that's the case. So. Uh, if I was sitting on a board, um, I think it's enough to say, hey, I want third party, third party validation of my uh, security in my firm, which means, hey, we take the security framework, whatever you're using, and you um, validate that. So it's important to me. Sure, is there a lot of other security questions I could ask? Sure, is there dual factor authentication happening in this organization, segregation of duties, do we have a firewall, do we have an IPS? Um, you know, how, up to, how often do you look at the firewall rules, et cetera? You know, there's a lot of detail and technical crap we could get into, um, but as a board member, most board members aren't gonna be looking at that from a technical standpoint. And um, I guess this is probably my last webinar since I used the word crap. Back to you, Mike. Josh, you have anything to add there? I, I think Dave uh, pretty much covered it all there. <laughs> um, <laughs> fair enough. Um, fair enough. So we're going to uh, move you, on. You know, one, uh, other, one other question. Oh, we're not going to move on yet. Okay. You know, and, and being a board member, one of the, the, the other things that is very important to me is the cyber insurance. You know, it might not be exactly part of this webinar, but it, you – you asked about, what, as a board member, what I would be thinking about. And the one thing I would make sure is that the cyber insurance is tied to this, the IT security group. You know, if you have your COO dealing with the cyber insurance and, has, and they have no interaction with the security group, you have an issue. Um, so that's one thing I would also be, uh, be concerned about. That's a good point. Very good point. And I think... As those things come up, Dave, feel free to just interrupt Josh and um, say what you feel like you need to say, because there's a lot of great thoughts in your brain. Most of them aren't relevant to this webinar, but uh, <laughs> we still like to hear them. Appreciate that, Mike. Good. So we're going to move on. And because Dave has talked far more than um, any of us needed to hear, we're going to ask Josh <laughs> to take the lead on this next question. So uh, Josh, really really important as I'm sitting in, in the seat of an organization, looking at my cybersecurity risk management program or lack thereof and thinking, we've been so busy that we probably haven't really looked at anything in two years. I know I do a terrible job, uh, or I think I do a terrible job, but it's important to me to, to think about it. Um, so I don't have a good program should I even think about this as a service that I should engage you for? So this is Dave. Now I'm just <laughs> uh, Yeah, essentially it, it's something that you, that you should still be thinking about, even if you don't think you're doing a great job as of now, that's where CPAs like us come into play. Um, we can come in and take a look through your cybersecurity risk management program and we can determine, um, you know, Hey, if you're not doing that great of a job, um, Here's some here's some suggestions that we'll have. Um, we'll help you through a process um, that we call pre-assessment, and that's where uh, Dave and I will come in, or other members of our team, and work with you side by side, provide you with guidance, provide you with suggestion, suggestions, recommendations, um, anything to take your cybersecurity risk management program um, from good Mike to to great. Um, and then from there, we'll move on into our actual uh, SOC for cybersecurity testing. But that's kind of like the, the foundation and the beginning of it will help you improve, will help you build, um, and will help you land a solid cybersecurity risk management program. You really now, really in this day and age, need to have a cybersecurity risk management program. Um, it's, you know, if you don't have one now, you're sort of behind the eight ball. Um, so, you need to start somewhere. And I think, you know, like I said in earlier, it's going to take you a lot longer to get the SOC for cybersecurity validation, um, the report, but you need to start now. Um, and one of the things that we can do is work with you through that framework, um, you know, get all, get the vulnerability scans going, get the annual penetration tests 
going, you know, all sorts of, of different things that um, your organization needs to be successful? So I'm afraid to ask this question, but um, if I'm pretty sure I'm going to fail the SOC for cybersecurity, I should still call you? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, let me let me uh, change change uh, your question there, Mike. Um, there there is no such thing as failure, in my opinion, on the SOC for cybersecurity. Um, it isn't a pass fail um, report. Uh, it, it's a report that will come in, and yes, you may receive a qualified opinion if the SOC for cybersecurity, um, if some things aren't operating effectively and designed effectively. Um, but at the end of the day, that is something that you can learn and build and grow um, and able to tailor your cybersecurity risk management program um, in order for it to be effective uh, in, in the coming years. Um, I know uh, there there may be some differing opinions uh, from from Dave, so see what he has to say. I'm not a huge believer in participation awards, so um, I would say that there are ways you can fail. Um, so when when you get to SOC for Cybersecurity, the value there is that you get a qualified opinion. And you can share that with your board, your investors, your customers, your clients. And I feel like if you get an adverse or, unqualif or a qualified opinion, um, that is not really, although it may be um, upping your game in the framework and your security, um, it's ultimately not a success. Um, so I am looking for always a success. But I, I think that's where the pre-assessment does come into play. Um, and I, I think that can kind of take away some of those concerns of failure um, that you mentioned, Mike. Um, so even if you think you might fail a SOC for cybersecurity, that's where the pre-assessment stage comes into play. And um, we can work with you and guide you in order to make sure that you know things are in good shape uh, before we actually come through and do our, our SOC for cybersecurity audit. That's exactly it. That's why we do the pre-assessment. You know, that's why we do that. And we won't put go into the testing until we know that everything, you know, the, the I's are dotted, T's are crossed. Um, and that, um, so you shouldn't fail. Um, I hate talking about failure because we want to succeed. Fair enough. And Dave, we'll uh, acknowledge the fact that you're not interested in the participation trophy. Um, some people call that a paycheck, but <laughs> we'll see that you don't get yours. <laughs> so let's move on to our final final question to wrap things up. And, and Josh, you've touched a little bit on um, the word pre-assessment and what that looks like. And Dave, you explored a little bit about what the front end of one of these engagement looks like. Uh, but let's wrap up with a real clear picture of what a cybersecurity engagement might look like if you're engaged to do one and what the deliverable is. Uh, and before you guys answer that question, let me just remind our audience, if there are any questions that you have, please pose those now and we'll try and get uh, a few answers in here as we wrap things up. Sure, uh, so the SOC for Cyber uh, Security um, timeline, as we like to put it, um, would start off with, um, as Dave and I mentioned, the pre-assessment. And that's just uh, a reading and understanding of whichever criteria you end up choosing for your SOCs uh, or for your risk management program. Um, and we'll go ahead and map that program in place to the criteria, um, identify any gaps you currently have in your controls, um, make recommendations for new controls that can be added, um, and remediate anything that seems not to be operating effectively. Um, the pre-assessment can vary in length, as Dave uh, mentioned earlier, kind of depending on where your uh, cybersecurity risk management program is um, as of now. Some may have nothing in place. Some may have a pretty strong one in place. So the pre-assessment can, can vary um, at that point. Um, from there, we'll move on to our testing phase, and that's going to be um, the time where we're going to come in. We're going to take our hats off from being um, kind of uh, the the individuals with guidance and recommendations. We're going to take that hat off and put on our auditor's hats, um, and we're going to perform walkthroughs of um, all your processes and procedures, and, and we're going to um, have our samples, and we're going to test everything, um, and then we're going to provide you with feedback um, in the form of our, our um, end report. So I don't know, Dave, if, if you have any uh, additional information on that, kind of more specifics on how long in terms of time each one of those 
sections could take? I mean, I, I think it varies. You know, I think if you have a dynamite framework and you've got all your controls in place, you probably could get the pre-assessment done in three months. And then um, the software cybersecurity won't, won't take very much longer after that. Um, so I, I think it could be done very quickly. Um, I do think if you have no controls and you're a fairly decent size organization, which probably there's not a ton of them out there that don't have any frameworks in place um, that are large, um, you could be looking at two years to get that in place. Um, or, you know, if you're going to make it a priority and you're going to hire people and, um, you know, you could probably get it done sooner. Um, but, you know, the key to the, all this is, you know, you can't overnight go from zero to 100. Uh, but we want to move that ball down the road um, in a steady fashion as quick as possible. So, you know, as long as you're improving, you know, that's what we're looking for here. Um, you know, your goal, your goal's in sight, um, but, you know, this might be overwhelming to you, but one step at a time. Um, you know, if you're not doing dual factor today, you do dual factor, you know, next month, you know, that's a win. Um, and you're just going to continually do this. And this is not something where you get done and you're done. It's an annual thing where you're just continually improving, um, continually monitoring, we're continually testing, um, and just like the SOC 1 and SOC 2 reports are annual, this is an annual test. Um, so that being said, uh, we want to continually improve. Good. Appreciate that, guys. Um, we've got a couple questions that have come in, so we'll take our last few minutes of time here to walk through those. Uh, so first question is pretty straightforward answer. So the first question is, is the SOC for cybersecurity completely separate from the regular financial statement audit or A133 audit that you might receive as an organization? Yes, it, it, is, it is a separate, uh, separate report. Um, the financial statement audit will be on its own. Um, we'll come in at another time and go through the pre-assessment, our testing, um, and then issuing a separate SOC for cybersecurity report. Yeah, so the, the Financial statement audit standards require an auditor to understand the internal controls surrounding IT and how IT impacts the audit. Uh, but as we've talked about a little bit over the course of the last hour, um, IT and cybersecurity are very different things. So understanding the internal controls surrounding IT and how IT influences audit does not enable us to really move too far down the path of cybersecurity. Um, so they are very different engagements. They are very different purposes, very different processes. Um, and while there, there's overlap, it's very minimal. Um, so a similar or related question says, uh, is there advantage to engaging the same firm for both the regular financial statement audit and the SOC for cybersecurity? And I would say the answer to that is yes, uh, because that familiarity with what the organization does, familiarity with the people and familiarity with the IT environment absolutely um, makes a cybersecurity understanding uh, a little bit more efficient because you already understand a lot of the significant pieces. Uh, Dave, important question for you, and we knew we would get this one on the webinar, uh, and I know what your answer is going to be. Can you provide a broad idea of what the cost is for a pre-assessment? You know, my answer is going to be, whew, it all depends. <laughs> Got it. The, uh, you know, for a uh, organization that has a good framework, um, a, a solid framework with controls, and sort of do all the right things, it could be uh, as minimum of three to six grand. Um, so, you know, and, and, and that's rough numbers, you know. Um, so it depends on the size of the organization, et cetera. So um, I probably even shouldn't have thrown a number out, but if that was a perfect organization, that, that would work. Um, so, but, you know, if you're doing it over two years, it's going to get pricey, but, you know, you've got to put a, a price on security. Yeah, it, I, I... The it depends is the answer that uh, I expected, and um, and I think you're right. When things are clean and when a client has somebody who takes ownership of the mapping and the linkages mm -hmm. and getting all the documentation in place, um, that pre-assessment phase is still important but can be a fairly minimal cost before embarking on a SOC for cybersecurity engagement. So mm -hmm. the final question that we have posed uh, is how does the size of an organization affect the process for a SOC for cybersecurity engagement, and what departments or staff from an organization would need to be involved in that process? Organization size is, 
plays a lot into the cybersecurity for SOC. Um, there is, you know, a large organization a lot of times going to have a risk, man, risk management department um, and it's going to have their own security group. So, you know, if you have a security group that's uh, monitoring firewalls, you know, monitoring the IPS, uh, doing all the controls, the testing, et cetera, um, you're going to have a lot um, probably better framework. You know, you're going to have a lot more controls, a lot more testing. A uh, smaller organization may only have one IT guy, or maybe they outsource their IT guy. Um, you know, but we still have to identify, I believe, who that security person is, who, 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 where the buck stops again. Um, so, you know, the organization size makes a, a, a big difference. Um, so I... It does. I mean, it's at the end of the day, the report is going to be uh, fairly similar, hopefully, a, a unqualified opinion. Um, but you know, we've we do a lot of uh, SOC two reports for small organizations, and we do them for very large organizations. Um, and there's going to be different controls for each organization. Some organizations, you know, we're going to have mitigating controls because there's not enough people. So. You know, each organization, there's not one set of controls for each organization. So your organization's unique, um, your people are unique, your data is unique, your processes are unique, your policies are unique, um, and, you know, our testing is going to be unique, et cetera. So um, it, does, it does play a big part. But I, I have to say that I think we could do a SOC cybersecurity for any size organization. Great. Great. Thank you. So that wraps up our our questions, wraps up our presentation. So first and foremost, uh, thank you, Dave, and thank you, Josh, <clears throat> for the time and the information shared. A uh, couple of things before I turn it back over to Melissa to wrap us up. Uh, if you are a subscriber to our newsletter and our information, you'll have noted a series of articles published over the last um, the last few months on SOC for Cybersecurity and what that means. Uh, hopefully most of what you heard today, if not all of what you heard today, is consistent with what you read in our articles. Uh, but I invite you to go read those, and there is one more yet to be published. Uh, we also have a upcoming seminar that's been announced. Um, our first version of it uh, will be in New Jersey, but in the fall we'll be doing a Central Pennsylvania, uh, Harrisburg, area presentation on uh, cybersecurity as part of a, a broader security seminar. So we invite you to pay attention to our, <clears throat> our newsletters and our information and make sure that uh, as necessary uh, you sign up for those because they promise to be uh, even more informative than this last hour has been. So thank you very much. Again, I'm Mike Hoffner, uh, the practice leader for our SOC practice here at McConley and Asbury, and I would absolutely welcome the opportunity to speak with you about how we might assist you in a SOC for cybersecurity security, a SOC 1, a SOC 2, or a SOC 3 engagement. Thank you once again for joining us for this webinar recap produced by McConley and Asbury. We hope you join us for our future webinars. You can stay connected and learn more about all of our upcoming events by visiting us at macpas.com. Thanks again and have a great day.